train, for its type, is the most powerful vehicle on land. And the engines of Sodor are the power behind the docks, industries and branch lines that make up the world-renowned Northwestern Railway. These are the stories of Sodor. Fettler, fireman, soldier, station master, manager, director of the railway board. Up to 1938, that had been the career path of Sir Topham Hatt, better known as the Fat Controller. I don't think there's ever been a more respected or well-known figure among Britain's railways than that stout gentleman. So, it was quite the shock when he arrived unexpectedly on Sodor. Sir, Sir Topham, uh, I, uh, I, hello, John. Good to see you too. Sorry to arrive so suddenly. N no need to apologize, sir. It's a pleasure to have you here. Ho, ho, ho! No need to lick my boots, old friend. This isn't a royal visit, just a simple inspection. Forgive me for asking, sir, but why you? Surely you have more important things to worry about. If that were true. I wouldn't be here at all, but we'll discuss that later. For now, who might these fine engines be? Are they yours or Nigel's? I'm proud to say they're mine, sir. Allow me to introduce you to Edward, Eric and Toby. Toby, would you be the engine whom the J-70s were modelled after? Yes, sir, I would be. Then this is a true delight. How so, sir? Because... I took my son for a ride on the maiden voyage of the first J-70 ever built by the LNER. After that, he fell in love with trains. I can see him one day becoming a controller, though I'm hoping he'll be slightly slimmer. Oh, you don't look that bad, sir. Eric! Ho, 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 It's all right, John. It's just a title, after all. A pleasure meeting you all. I look forward to seeing you in action throughout this inspection. I suppose we should get down to business, John. Yes, sir. Please, this way. Huh, what a nice man. Aye, very pleasant. I'm suddenly not so anxious about this inspection. What do you think the rest of the lads will say when they hear about this? Confusion and disbelief were the obvious answers, and not just among our own crew. News of the Fat Controller's presence spread like wildfire across the island, and he didn't waste any time getting to work. Over the next several weeks, he was a constant sight about the line, and we did our very best to show him just how useful and productive we were. Likewise of the railway staff, who answered the many questions put to them by the stout director. Throughout the inspection, rumors abounded as to the reason behind it, and very few of them were flattering, after all, as Alice had said, it was widely known that the railway board had the authority to close down entire branches if they were deemed unprofitable, inefficient, or downright dilapidated. It wouldn't be until the very near end that we would find out what category Sodor fell into. Probably the most trying aspect of the inspection was being emphatically reminded by our directors to behave, especially when in the company of our rivals, <sighs> By George, that was difficult. No matter what, we had to hold our tongues around the middies, and they did likewise. In truth, I'm surprised we held out as long as we did. But, I'm sorry to say, this facade came to an abrupt end during the Fat Control's visit to Arlesborough. He's here! He's actually here! This is so exciting! Indeed. It's almost as thrilling as if His Grace the Duke of Sodor were visiting. So I expect you both to be on your best behavior. What do you think we're going to do, Grandpuff? With you two, 
I never know. So I'm getting in first. No mischief and no impertinence from you scallywags. Understood? <sighs> Understood? Yes! Good. Good day, engines. I'm Sir Topham. Yes, sir. We know who you are. Welcome to the mid Railway. My name is Duke. This is Stuart and Falcon. I'm proud to meet you. I must say, I've been looking forward to visiting this little line, as I have a keen fondness for narrow-gauge railways. You do, sir? Oh, yes. Engines like yourselves were an invaluable asset during the Great War. Is there... Any chance we could hear a couple of stories, sir? Falcon! Ho, 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 It's all right, Duke. It's a common question. I suppose I could share a few during my... Hold up. Is something wrong, sir? I... know that whistle. What the... Am I seeing things? Stanley? Colonel! It is you! Oh, this is wonderful! Back up a moment! You know the director, Stanley? I do! From where? He and I served together during the war. <laughs> what? You were in the war? Yes. I mentioned that, didn't I? No. Are you sure? It's not the sort of thing an engine tends to forget, Stanley. Huh. That's surprising. I take it then that I didn't mention I was built in America? I'll take that as a no. How can anyone be that absent-minded? I don't know. Sorry about that, lads. This is quite embarrassing. Looks like you've got some explaining to do. All right. I'll start at the beginning. I was built in 1917 at the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Pennsylvania. That same year, I was exported to Europe to take part in the war. Why don't you have an accent then? Because he hadn't been assembled properly. When he arrived, he was not in a serviceable condition. We had to fix him up in one of our workshops, which took over a month. That was where he received his first firing. And the moment I was ready, I set to work delivering supplies about the local towns. Sometimes, I had to go to the front. I always hated those runs, as it meant I had to see destroyed homes. And worse. Hmm. That war brought out the worst in us all. I must say, Colonel, I'm thrilled to see you recovered from... Oh, come on, you blasted truck! What's going on over there? Sounds like Adam's in a right old state. Too right. Stanley, go see what's wrong. Right, Yar. All right there, Adam? Hardly. This miserable tanker somehow rolled out of its siding over there straight into my path. I tried moving it, but its wretched brakes have jammed on. Well, it looks like the lads are working on it, so it should get sorted soon. Considering I'm running late to pick up my next train, I'm wanting something more immediate than soon. Ask, and ye shall receive. She's all good. Finally. Unfortunately, the workman had loosened the truck's brakes too much. Given it was full to the brim with tar, and that the tracks sloped slightly downwards, the wagon was quick to get away from the Midis number 3. A simple derailment could have been the worst of it, had James not been leaving the yard at that very moment. Our number 5 was bursting with pride, having been complimented by the Fat Controller for bringing him to Arlesborough. As a consequence, he never saw it coming. Bust my buffers! James! Are you alright? After being belted by a tar wagon? I'm just tip top, thanks for asking. I'm so sorry. Don't worry. I'll call Mickey and... Wait! What are you sorry for? Did you do this? Well... Yes. 
I was moving that truck and it got away from me. Cool. Typical MIDI. Can't handle a simple task without turning it into a disaster. Oi! I can shunt trucks just fine. If that were true, this wouldn't have happened at all, you maroon-coated moron. Keep up the insults, James, and I might just leave you there. And how do you suppose to get out of the yard, then? Bother! Gah. You are an utter prat, Adam. You and the rest of your crew, and to call you a rusty red pile of scrap iron would be an insult to scrap metal everywhere. Good grief. It's worse than I thought. The spill at Arlesborough was cleaned up swiftly, and James was delivered to the works likewise, where he was repaired and cleaned. As I said, the gloves came off after that. With renewed ferocity and little restraint, we traded insults back and forth. The Fat Controller witnessed a number of these exchanges, yet remained oddly silent. That was until a rather unfortunate incident at Napford Harbour. But before I get into that, I need to backtrack a little. About a week or so beforehand, we'd received a new shipment of bogey-mounted coaches that were intended to replace our current branch line and local passenger fleets. And in the short time we'd had them till then, they became extremely popular, as they were roomier, could hold more people, and were far more comfortable. A good number of them were also non-faceless, contrary to a previous occasion in which I said Annie and Clarabelle were the only non-faceless coaches on the standard gauge lines. But I digress. The vast majority of these non-faceless coaches were very pleasant and charming individuals you could spend endless hours chatting with. And then there were the others, the very definition of snobbery and vanity. These prigs could espouse hubris and pettiness in a single sentence, and we argued with them almost as often as we did with the middies. Percy had the misfortune of taking three such coaches as part of the afternoon service on the loop. That was how it started. Oh, thank goodness, we finally stopped. Indeed, Hyacinth, the way this one handles us, it's a miracle we haven't fallen to pieces. None of the passengers have complained about my handling, which is further proof pertaining to the existence of miracles. Quite right, Rose. If it becomes too unbearable, you could always consider a career change. To what, exactly? Hmm, let me think. Something that suits your exalted position. I know, you could become cattle trucks. Oh, what a horrid engine. Oh, and our torture resumes. <laughs> Tell me about it. Then, they complained about the way I shunted them. The way I shunted them. What are they on about? Steady, Percy. You're getting worked up over nothing. Uh, I know. It's just... Frustrating? Yes, that's it. Those snobs have been getting on my nerves too. You've been thinking up ways to pay them out, haven't you? Of course. And I think today is the day to do it. What have you got in mind? First, where'd you shunt them? The outermost track next to the station. Perfect! It really was meant to be today. Go on, Thomas. Don't keep us in suspense. Right. This is the plan. I'll come up alongside them and act all apologetic on your behalf. They'll eat that up, I'm sure. While I've got them distracted, you come up through the station. On the other side, find yourself a good position. When you have, let off your whistle as loud as you can. And Bob's your uncle, they'll be scared off their chassis and we'll be laughing until our boilers split. Ooh, that's wicked. I love it. You want in? Wish that I could, but I have to marshal a goods train that's set to leave in 20 minutes. So I best get a move on. Let me know how it turns out. Good luck. We don't need luck. We've got skill. Come on, Thomas. Let's put it to good use. Right behind you, Percy. Ah, 
Hello, Hyacinth. Oh, what do you want? I heard about how rough Percy was with you today. Indeed, he nearly shook us to pieces. I've had complaints in the past about his handling, but no matter how many times I tell him, some engines just can't be taught to right. Anyway, I'm sorry. Well, I certainly appreciate that, Thomas. Nice to know at least one of you recognises our value. That if we're to be of any use to our passengers, we need to be handled delicately. You're absolutely right. Nothing but the best for the best. As you can see, it was child's play for Thomas to keep Hyacinth and her sisters occupied. But that would be the extent of his planned success. As instructed, Percy moved into position. He was very excited by the prospect of paying out the coaches. Unfortunately, this meant he approached the station too fast and didn't notice the unattended porter's trolley rolling towards the tracks. Oh, what? Now how in fizzling fireboxes did this happen? And what's this all over my buffer beam? Is that... Jam? Raspberry by the smell of it. Why is there so much of it at a train station? I think you've got a more immediate concern, Percy. Oh dear. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so sorry. I should think so. S S yes, yes, we all know who I am. Let's skip that bit and get down to the part where you explain yourself. Uh... Uh, I can't, sir. I thought not. I mean, look at this. Yes, sir. I am, sir. And would you like to hazard a guess as to who owns those trousers? Oh, no. Oh, yes. My best trousers, too. Yes, sir. Please, sir. The passengers will need to be compensated for their spoiled clothes, and my trousers are ruined. I hope this will teach you not to play tricks with the coaches. He knew you were trying to sneak up on the coaches. How? I don't know. I didn't ask, and I certainly didn't tell him. He's a career railwayman. He could probably spot a prank a mile away. Ah, <sighs> you've really done it this time, Thomas. Oh, come on. It wasn't my fault a trolley rolled onto the tracks. True. But if you hadn't been trying to pull one of your juvenile pranks, it mightn't have been so bad. It could have been a whole lot worse, Toby. Not for Mr. Starr, I think. Mr. Starr? Yes. It was bad enough the passengers got caught in the crossfire. But for it to soil the back controller's trousers? You don't think this will have repercussions for our director? I thought Mr. Starr and the back controller were friends. They are. But friendship can only go so far in business. I know that from experience. Oh, blimey. You're right. We've botched things up for him royally. What do you think will happen, Toby? I don't know. But I hear Sir Topham is having a meeting with Mr. Starr and Mr. Zorro on Thursday. Both directors? Any idea why? Well, neither side has endeared itself to the Fat Controller during his inspection. So who knows? Maybe he'll boot them out and take control of the railway himself. The Fat Controller's railway? Huh. Worse things could happen. Like we could all get reassigned. Why would that happen? Because we were the engines who fouled up. If I were in his position, I'd want to clear out the old staff before taking over. You think that'll happen, Toby? I don't know, Eric. I really don't know. John? Nigel? So, do you think one... Or both of us will get the sack. Search me. I was feeling rather good about this inspection. Until Percy decided to wear Sir Topham's trousers as a blooming scarf. Hmm. And Adam's little accident at Alsborough did not cast a positive light upon my crew. <sighs> well, no point in dawdling. Let's get this over with. Hello, John. Hello, Nigel. Hello, sir. Afternoon, sir. 
All right, let's get right down to it. This inspection has certainly been interesting. Sir, I cannot apologize strongly enough for what happened at the harbor, nor I for Arsber. Yes, those were unfortunate events, but they were mere trifles compared to the overall problem. I don't understand, sir. You asked me, John, why I was carrying out this inspection. It's because, ever since I became director five years ago, Sodor has been a recurring issue. Brushes with the law, mismanaged budgets, insubordinations. Your head officers don't seem to think there's a problem, so the board has decided to step in. Sir, with all due respect, if our head officers think we're in the clear, then why would the board care? Because your head officers don't see the larger picture. The board has to consider the welfare of all British railways, especially given the current situation in Europe. We have to make sure the system is operating at peak efficiency. Sodor has been underperforming in that regard. Frankly, I chalk it up to Parliament's ridiculous decision to allow the LMS and the LNER to operate on such a small region of track. Are you saying you're going to remove one of us from Sodor? Who? I haven't decided yet. It's not something I want to do, but if you can give me a reason not to, I'm all ears. Both directors did indeed give a number of reasons, citing all manner of facts and figures in the hopes of contradicting Sodor's supposed inefficiencies. The Fact Controller would later write in his memoirs that he did take their replies into consideration, but that he was looking for something more. That something would come from a completely unexpected and unpleasant source. But that is a story for another day.